Thank you very much. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, so uh, let me just sort of set the background um, by reminding you of what's going on right now. Right? Enormous excitement about AI, huge investments going on. The UK with a billion pounds, France with 1.5 billion euros, so they're outdoing the British. Um, the EU wants to talk about 18 billion pounds, and then, of course, we all know that China is investing a very large amount of money in AI. And you know, some of the reasons are um, the progress in object rec try that again progress in object recognition, um, which is now uh, at least on the ImageNet dataset, uh, significantly exceeded human capabilities. The victory over Lee Sedol in Go, um, these amazing results on uh, uh, image captioning. So here's a, a group of people shopping at an outdoor market. There are many vegetables in the fruit stand. Very exciting when we see this kind of thing. People start to get a feeling that maybe finally AI is starting to happen. Um, so I do want to give credit to, uh, to Google and, and Vignal's group for for confessing that the system doesn't always work. So here is a uh, refrigerator filled with lots of food and drink. Um, you know, and when you see that, like, how could it be that amazing on the previous example and then this, this terrible on this example? And I, you go back and look at the previous example and actually you realize, well, there is no group of people. There's just individuals doing their own thing. Um, no one is shopping. These are people getting the stands ready for sale. Uh, and there is no fruit stand. So in fact, most of the annotation was wrong, even though this was uh, portrayed as a successful example of image captioning. Um, so I think we have to be a little bit cautious uh, about over-interpreting the success that we've had so far. So, I, sorry, I have no idea why it keeps doing this. Um, okay, I know why. All right, let's go back. Um, so The Economist had a front page saying data is the new oil. Um, everyone uh, has a theory that the more data you have, the more chance you have of taking over the world. Um, and I think this is probably nonsense. Um, for you know, a, a simple technical reason, if nothing else, right? That um, as we actually improve our capability of machine learning, so that uh, we have better learning curves. In other words, we learn. Uh, more accurate predictive models from fewer examples, uh, then data becomes less and less important. So as systems in particular acquire prior knowledge and then use that to learn from uh, future examples, uh, then the quantity of data you have is going to be less significant. Um, and, uh, and I think we are moving in this direction. And if we don't, uh, then um, you know, I think that we might see uh, another AI winter when uh, purely data-driven deep learning techniques run into a, uh, an exponential barrier that, that for many tasks, the amount of data you need is exponential or super exponential uh, and you're never going to acquire that data. So um, another possibility, I, I worry a little bit about autonomous vehicles. I know that Raquel gave a great talk yesterday about the progress happening uh, in Uber, but there's been a, a lot of setbacks, people being killed. Uh, recently, Honda had a major government demo that was a complete disaster. They mowed down the, the, the dummy four-year-old child uh, without even noticing that it was there. Um, and uh, you know, so if, uh, and we're also seeing like some, some of the car companies are thinking like, no, no, we're, you know, we spent $2 billion already and we're getting nowhere. Uh, maybe we're going to pull back our investment. So I think if that happens on a larger scale, we might see a kind of a loss of faith um, and the same kind of pullback that happened in the late 80s. Um, and I think we're seeing a little bit of, of uncertainty even among the, the apostles of deep learning. So Francois Cholet, who wrote the, uh, the Python machine learning textbook, um, says many more applications are completely out of reach for current deep learning techniques, even given vast amounts of human annotated data. Um, and he then later on proposes that the main direction for the future would be models closer to general purpose computer programs. Um, so if you've been uh, awake for the last 20 years, 
then you know that, in fact, within the, the, the non-deep learning community, there are already models close to general purpose computer programs. Uh, the parabolistic programming field uh, is using uh, universal languages, so uh, think C++ or Lisp or uh, first order logic um, as, uh, as a base for creating extremely powerful formal languages for defining um, generative probability models. And with those languages come general purpose inference capabilities, usually based on uh, MCMC or some relative of that. Um, so this is kind of a di digression, but uh, since we're at UAI, I wanted to talk about uh, this, and there's some good news at the end. Um, and I want to talk about a particular example, which is um, detecting nuclear explosions. So um, since 1945, there have been uh, 2,055, roughly, nuclear explosions on the Earth. And um, they have killed about 300,000 people, probably 200,000 um, in the two explosions in Japan in 1945, and then another 100,000 people killed by radioactive fallout from the nuclear testing. Um, so just for fun, here's a picture of um, tourists at the nuclear test site in Nevada. Uh, this is a small, uh, this is the crater from a small nuclear test uh, that was about one five hundredths of the size of the largest ever nuclear test which took place in Siberia. Um, so nuclear testing is a very serious matter for um, global security and there's a treaty called the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty uh, which obviously bans nuclear testing on the Earth uh, and it includes a global seismic monitoring system in order to detect people who are cheating. Um, and so we decided, let's see if we can formulate this as a, a Bayesian machine learning problem um, where the evidence is the waveforms coming from the seismic stations which are scattered around the world, something called the International Monitoring System. Um, and uh, so seismic waveforms like the, this, you know, the sort of the wiggles, um, they, the detectors measure movement of the Earth uh, down to one nanometer, um, so incredibly sensitive, um, and it's all, the Earth is also an incredibly noisy place, uh, it turns out. And the query is what happened. So you'd like to know what are all the seismic events that occurred, um, and where did they occur, how big were they, how deep were they, uh, and what type were they. Um, and so this is called the bulletin. So every day uh, at the UN in Vienna, they produce a bulletin of all the seismic events that occur, and they flag the ones that are suspicious. And then what do we know? What's the prior knowledge that we have? Well, we actually know a great deal. For example, we know that the Earth is a 3D object, that it's roughly spherical. We know that uh, seismic waves travel uh, in contiguous paths. Uh, and different types of seismic waves have different velocities uh, and different rates of absorption in rock uh, and so on. We know something about how likely it is that a detector will detect a signal of a given magnitude uh, against background noise of a given uh, intensity. And so this knowledge can be written down, and um, there it is. Uh, I'm not going to go through this, but this is a program in the blog language, uh, and so it, it's a a declaration, it's a declarative language, so we are stating uh, in the language everything we know uh, about the geophysics of seismic event occurrence and seismic signal transmission and detection. And, um, and so this is now the monitoring system for the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, this program, along with uh, MCMC inference that uh, makes it run fast enough. So just to show you the, um, the progress that we've made, this is the detection failure rate for the, the existing, or I should say the previous United Nations system, which was developed over a decade and cost uh, about $100 million uh, just for the software component. The, the hardware component is actually over a billion dollars for all the detection stations and satellite transmission. Um, so you can see it's between 30 and 50% in different magnitude ranges. And then the system that uh, is based on that blog model uh, called NetVisa, um, and as early as 2011, we showed that this actually reduced the error rate um, by a factor of two to three. Uh, and we've actually pushed it further down since then. Um, and then we had to wait while various diplomatic wheels turned or didn't turn uh, and various committees and 
uh, you know, some, someone had to convince the Iranians that it was a good idea to improve the detection capability of the seismic monitoring network. Um, I had no idea how they did that. But anyway, as of January 2018, uh, NetVisa is now part of the official monitoring system for the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Um, and just one uh, other illustration, this is the 2013 uh, test that took place in North Korea. And um, this is, uh, so this is a satellite uh, image of the general area where it took place. And this is the location uh, that was estimated by uh, essentially all the world's leading geophysicists who, who got together immediately after the event and uh, analyzed all the signals and tried to figure out where it happened. Uh, this was the location that was automatically produced by the NetVisa system at the time of the event. Um, and then later on, they found the tunnel entrance to the, um, to the nuclear testing facility, uh, about 700 meters from where we said the event took place. Okay, so um, it's an interesting question about uh, how deep learning and probabilistic programming are going to move forward. Uh, and we are seeing some signs of various kinds of mergers because uh, you know, deep learning and generative models uh, actually have a lot in common. Um, and uh, I'm actually fairly optimistic uh, that deep learning will get itself uh, beyond the plateau um, that it may be facing otherwise. Uh, so whatever happens in the future um, with these particular technological developments, um, I think it's prudent for us to assume that we will eventually figure out solutions to the major open problems of AI. Um, I mean, it's possible that we're all just too stupid uh, and uh, we'll, we'll never figure out these problems. Um, there's no mathematical or physical reason why uh, machines shouldn't be more capable than humans. Um, and in my, in my estimation, uh, in the last 20 years, we've actually knocked over several of the major conceptual problems uh, that, stand, that stood between us and human level AI, and we have a few more. Um, and given the rate of investment uh, and the number of amazingly smart people coming into the field, I really think we will, we will get there. Um, so when I say making decisions better than humans, um, I mean uh, they are clearly going to have access to more information than any human can have access to. Uh, you know, once they can read, they can read everything human race has ever written. Um, and no human can do that. Uh, and just as AlphaGo looks further into the future than uh, Lee Sedol on the Go board, um, we will figure out how AI systems can look further into the future than humans in the real world. Uh, and you put those two things together, you have systems that are just making better decisions than we can. And this has um, a very significant upside. So that, you know, the re why are we doing AI? Uh, it's because uh, intelligence is the fuel of our civilization. And if we have access to much more of it, uh, we can have a much better civilization. Um, and if you just, so I did a little back of the envelope calculation. Um, just using AI, for example, you know, construction robots to build houses uh, and roads and uh, you know, AI systems to organize uh, supply chains and, and um, transportation, things like that. If you just used AI to bring the living standards of everyone on Earth up to uh, a respectable Western level, and you said, okay, and what's the net present value uh, of that change uh, in GDP? It comes to $13,500 trillion, uh, which even by today's standards is a lot of money. Um, so in, in very crude terms, that's sort of the size of the prize uh, that people are pushing for uh, in, in building human-level AI. So it seems pretty unlikely that we're going to stop working on this. Um, because the momentum and the incentive is too great. And there are some downsides, and we've already seen uh, killer robots as one of the possible problems uh, of increasing AI capabilities. We've seen elimination of employment as a possibility, but I actually want to talk about this one, uh, the end of the human race, uh, because that seems like the most important uh, of those three. Um, so, and, and let me say, you know, al although this headline is typical clickbait, um, this is not something that is only 
uh, being promoted by uh, <clears throat> people outside the field. You know, Elon Musk talks about this, and he's not an AI researcher, and people criticize him because he doesn't know what he's talking about, so they say. Um, but, uh, you know, Alan Turing said the same thing. Marvin Minsky said the same thing. Um, Norbert Wiener said the same thing. So it's hard to uh, keep saying that this is only ignorant, stupid people who know nothing about AI um, because the problem is very straightforward. Um, so if you ask what's bad about better AI, I think um, Norbert Wiener put it uh, very well in a paper in 1960. Um, we'd better be quite sure that the purpose put into the machine is the purpose which we really desire. Okay. Um, and uh, this could have been said by King Midas uh, a lot earlier, in fact, or possibly he said something very similar to that, uh, because uh, we, we are notoriously bad at saying what exactly it is that we want. And, um, and, and that's sort of why I'm talking about this uh, at UAI, because uh, if you're not sure that you're saying exactly what you want completely and correctly, then you are uncertain about what the objective uh, should be that is going to be put into the machine. Uh, and if you're uncertain about it, the machine had better be uncertain about it and should not uh, view what you state the objective to be, like I want everything I touch to turn to gold. The machine should have told, or the gods should have told King Midas, well, are you sure you mean everything? Everything? What about your food? What about your drink? You know, how about we compromise and say, okay, each thing that you want to turn to gold, you know, point to it and say, abracadabra, blah, 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 and I'll change it to gold for you. How about that? Is that better? Right? That's how we want the machine to react uh, when we give it uh, a, a request. Right? Um, and, and then a few years ago, Steve Omohundro, um pointed out some of the consequences of taking objectives literally. Um, and even something as simple as fetching the coffee, right? A machine that's sufficiently intelligent doesn't, doesn't take a genius to realize that you can't fetch the coffee if you're dead. So by asking the machine to fetch the coffee, you give the machine an incentive to preserve its own existence. This is not something that you are building into it. You're not putting in some kind of self-preservation instinct that is biological, nothing like that, right? This is simply a logical consequence of having the objective of fetching the coffee. And, um, and therefore, uh, a sufficiently intelligent machine that can will take preemptive steps to protect its existence uh, in order to achieve whatever goal it has. And if that goal is not the one you really want uh, uh, after all, um, then you have a real problem, right? Now you've got a machine that's more intelligent than you that's pursuing an objective that's incorrectly stated uh, and is defending itself against any attempt to interfere or switch off the machine, right? Which is exactly the plot of 2001, the Space Odyssey, right? So, so HAL 9000 tell, you know, basically waits until Dave is outside. Uh, so tricks, I think, tricks Dave into going outside the spaceship and then locks the door uh, and won't let him back in again. Um, and uh, so this, this seems to be a problem, right? And, and I wanted to understand um, how we got ourselves into this mess. So, um, if you go back and think, okay, how do we define AI in the first place? Right? How do we? What do we think about AI um, as, as a field? Right? I mean, I know what physics is. It's coming up with predictive theories of the universe. You know, AI. Um, well, we looked at intelligence. Um, and we operate, operationalize this notion of what do we mean by saying a human is intelligent uh, in terms of uh, something like rationality, meaning actions that can be expected to achieve our objectives. So, so this is the notion that we use uh, for intelligence in humans. Our actions achieve our objectives. Um, and then we just translated that directly to the machine. We said, okay, machines are intelligent when their actions can be expected to achieve their objectives. Right? Seems pretty straightforward. Um, and in fact, this is not just the AI way of thinking. Um, when you look at control theory, it's exactly the same thing, right? They have a 
cost function j that they're minimizing. Uh, you know, economics, there's a utility function u that you're maximizing in operations research. There's a reward function, you're maximizing a sum of that. Um, in statistics, there's a loss function l that you're minimizing. Um, and so this, this idea that we essentially create machines, we specify the objective, and then the machine optimizes it on our behalf uh, is pervasive in, in the 20th century technological community. Um, and my, my view now is that this is a mistake. Right? We don't want machines that possess that form of intelligence uh, in its pure form um, because of the point that I just made, that we are not able to specify the objective correctly. Right? Um, so if you say, I'd like, uh, I don't know, I'd like um, cancer to be cured, as quickly as possible. Great. What could possibly be wrong with that? Okay, well, you know, fastest way to cure cancer is probably to induce tumors in the entire human population on Earth um, and then try millions of different treatments to see which ones work, right, while sequencing everyone's DNA at the same time. Um, and so, oops, okay, well, you know, wiped out the human race, but we got a cure for cancer really quickly. So, um, so we have to get away from this notion that the objective is something that is uh, observable, that is correct and specifiable, uh, that can be put into the machine. Um, so, but I think it's reasonable, at least, to work, have a working assumption that, that we do have objectives. We do have preferences over how we want things to turn out in the world. Um, but those are within us, and we want the machine to pay attention to those, right? Not whatever we happen to plug into its head, um, but the things that, the objectives that are within us. So let's use this different word, not intelligent, but beneficial, to the extent that the machine's actions can be expected to achieve our objectives, right? And those our, so now it's a kind of a latent variable. It's, it's something that's in us, and the machine doesn't have direct uh, observation access to it, okay? Um, and I think this is really important. Um, and then, if we get things right, we'll be able to build machines that are provably beneficial, that we will have theorems to the effect that a machine with this type of design is going to be provably beneficial to us. So now let's turn this into a little more constructive approach, right? And, and we have to have three laws. Um, so here are the three laws. Right, so the, the first is, okay, this, this notion that the latent object, the, the, the objective for the machine is the latent objective of realizing our preferences, human preferences, um, and that the machine is uncertain about what those are. So the, these two things uh, go together. And then um, there has to be a way for the machine to um, learn more about what these mysterious human preferences are. So there has to be a way in which they're grounded, um, and the, uh, the grounding uh, the, of, the, of the semantics of human preferences is in human choice behavior, right? And this is a, this is a very old idea in you know, preference elicitation and, and uh, inverse reinforcement learning and, and other areas where the choice behavior reveals information about the underlying preferences. Um, and I put an asterisk on that because it does it in a very imperfect way. Way And this is going to be, um, I think, the, where most of the, the research work has to go. So when you think about this idea of uncertainty in objectives, um, you know, we've been, uh, we've been worrying about uncertainty in AI since around 1980 or so. Uh, I think that's a, a reasonable, you know, I say roughly before then, people didn't worry about uncertainty. They, um, they took, you know, chess and other kinds of problems like that as sort of canonical, uh, where we know the rules of chess, right? There's no uncertainty about, you know, where my knight's going to end up. If I start moving in this direction, it usually ends up where I, I put it. Um, uh, you know, you can see the board, so there's no, there's no sensory uncertainty. The state is uh, typically fully observable. Um, so we didn't worry about it. And then sometime around 1980, uh, we started realizing that you know, expert systems uh, couldn't make uh, unequivocal predictions about what disease you had. 
um, that our, our models of the world, transition models and so on, couldn't be complete and correct. So there was going to have to be uncertainty. And then there was a big war. This is before most of you were uh, involved in AI. But there was a big war in the 80s between those who wanted to stay with logic and maybe tweak logic a bit to have um, defeasible conclusions and those who wanted to go whole hog into probability. And then there were other people who wanted Dempster to Schaefer and Fuzzy and, uh, and other stuff. But um, I would say, you know, probability won. Um, but the uncertainty was restricted to, you know, transition models, sensor models, and so on, but not the objective. Right. So why, why was that? Well, I, I'm not sure that it was ever clearly stated uh, in any of the textbooks, but there's a sort of folk theorem that says, look, if you look at a Markov decision process and you had uncertainty about what the reward for each transition was in that MDP, um, you can simply integrate it out. You know, everything is linear. We're looking at uh, maximizing the expected sum of rewards and, you know, expectations um, will, will commute in the appropriate way and then you just integrate out the uncertainty and it's exactly as if you took that distribution over rewards and replaced it with its, uh, with its expectation uh, as a certain, a certain reward. So it's certainty equivalent and um, so it's completely irrelevant. Right? Um, so if you had thought about uncertainty and rewards, you probably would have dismissed it fairly quickly and said, okay, yeah, got it. No, there's nothing, to, nothing here to look at. Um, but that theorem actually is just false, right? Because um, it only holds in the special case where the environment cannot provide any information about the reward. Right? As soon as it's possible to learn more about the reward function, uh, then that theorem just isn't true. Uh, the uncertainty matters a great deal. Um, and uh, for example, if there were two routes to take and one of them is going to take you, tell you a lot about the reward function and the other one isn't, uh, then you'll take the one that will tell you a lot about the reward function because knowing more about the reward function will improve your ability to optimize it. Um, and so um, you can actually, just as we have POMDPs with an observation model that tells you more about what state you're in, um, you can have a reward observation model. Um, so we call these uncertain reward MDPs. Um, and, um, and you can show that uh, they can be solved by a reduction to POMDPs, which in turn can be solved by a reduction to MDPs. So, um, so we're, we're still you know, within the, the realm of, of things that we know how to solve um, with uh, MDP solvers and so on. Um, another source of information about rewards is uh, actually seeing human beings do things. And, um, and there you're going to be outside the realm of, of MDPs because because now uh, there's another agent uh, in, in the world that you need to be concerned about. Um, so in a, another way of showing this is, is pictorially, right? Um, so you're all familiar with graphical models and the idea that um, if this top variable, the human objective, is observed, right, then the machine behavior, which is on the right, right, uh, becomes independent of the human behavior. So the objective is sort of a sufficient statistic for everything that the human cares about, right? And so the machine can simply then ignore human behavior uh, because it already knows the objective. It's not going to learn anything more by seeing the human jumping up and down saying, no, 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 stop, stop, you're going to destroy the world, right? But the machine says, oh, I already know the objective. Whatever it is you're doing with this jumping up and down stuff, I don't care, right? Uh, I'm just going to continue optimizing the objective, which I know to be true, right? Um, and uh, so, again, this is, I think, a, a big mistake, right? And if the objective is unobserved, right, then, you know, it's, you no longer have this separation. The machine behavior is no longer conditionally independent of uh, the human behavior. And so these things are going to remain coupled. And... Um, so this is going to lead us, as we'll see, into uh, inevitably uh, game theory formulations of decision making for machines, which is a pity because game theory is a pain, but uh, I don't see any way around this. 
Okay, um, so let's just look at a few very prosaic examples of, of why we do need to think about uncertainty and objectives uh, in very practical, simple cases. So, you know, what could be simpler than image classification, right? You know, this is, this is sort of now the canonical AI problem, uh, and as everyone knows, um, you uh, minimize the loss function, and uh, which means, um, you know, according to the criteria of the ImageNet competition, uh, the, having the lowest possible error rate, right? You know, what's wrong with that? Well, so implicitly, I mean, there is, you know, if you, if you study how statistics should be done, uh, you're supposed to pay attention to the loss matrix, right? The loss matrix tells you for each category A, what's the cost of misclassifying an object of type A as an object of type B or C or D or E, right? Um, now, the ImageNet criteria ignore that. So the cost in ImageNet of misclassifying, you know, one, uh, one type of dog as another type of dog is exactly the same as the cost of misclassifying a dog as a bus or, a do or uh, you know, a flower as an airplane, right? These are all just errors um, and uh, they, all, they all count the same, right? Now, if you then take that learning algorithm and then put it out in the wild, in the real world, then you accidentally misclassify a human as a gorilla. And um, that costs you hundreds of millions of dollars in fixing your public relations disaster uh, and being accused of uh, institutional corporate racism and all, and all the rest of it. And if you think about it, right, clearly the loss matrix is not actually uniform, right? But because we're so, we're so used to, you know, in, in, in uh, class, you know, when you learn the machine learning and in these competitions, it's assumed to be uniform. And so we forget that there is even this loss matrix there. But the loss matrix is the thing that is defining the objective. And if you assume that it's uniform or if you leave it out, then you're making it uniform by default. Uh, then that is wrong. That is not your actual objective. You made the King Midas mistake uh, and you paid for it, right? Now, if you think about it, um, you know, even for ImageNet, it's a, a million entry matrix. And um, actually, I'm not really sure what all those entries are. And so uh, we should probably think about how to write structured priors over loss matrices. Um, you know, so I have a pretty good idea that, you know, among the 120, thing, I think, breeds of dogs that they have in ImageNet, you know, I mean, maybe there are some dogs that are very, very sensitive about being misclassified as, as a, a wimpy poodle or something like that. But by and large, we're going to say, okay, th these are probably small uh, uh, losses for those, but, you know, between dogs and cats, maybe that's huge. And uh, other things, I'm really not sure about how sensitive cars are about being misclassified. So, um, so this is, uh, I would say, a pretty much unexplored territory. How do you write structured prior distributions over loss matrices? Uh, and then how does the machine learning algorithm work, right? It, you probably want the algorithm to say, uh, it's not safe to classify this image, right? Um, I'd rather, you know, pay a little and go back to the user and say, you know, should we classify this one? And if so, what should, what should we do? Rather than just um, operate uh, as if we knew the objective exactly and we had the best possible classifier. Um, it's another example, right? Just fetch, fetch the coffee. So in, when, we, when we do robotics, and you know, there are plenty of uh, robot projects around the world that will fetch you a cup of coffee, right? When you specify fetch the coffee as the objective, that becomes the life's mission of that robot uh, until it's complete, right? Which is uh, probably not what you really want, okay? Um, for example, in the real world, uh, you know, if the coffee costs $75, do you want the robot to buy it for you? Uh, if it requires traipsing across 150 miles of desert, do you want the robot to, to do that and come back three days later? Uh, on its last legs with a cup of coffee? Probably not. Um, you know, do you want the robot to, <clears throat> to taser all the other people in Starbucks in case they switch it off uh, before getting the coffee? Probably not, right? So uh, there's a great deal that a robot could do in the course of getting coffee that uh, is not part of that objective function and we need to worry about it. Um, and so you might ask, look, if, if if there's so much uncertainty, you know, isn't this just going to leave the robot to be completely paralyzed, 
right? That uh, the only thing it's ever going to do is ask you, you know, okay, is it okay if I move three inches forward? Is it okay if I move three inches forward? Is it okay if I move three inches forward? Right? It's, uh, it's going to be a complete pain uh, because it won't be able to do anything for fear of, of uh, trespassing onto some part of the utility function that it doesn't know about. Um, so I think this is a significant concern. We need to study what we can do. Uh, well, two things. One is how do we make decisions when there is a great deal of uncertainty about the objective function? And, um, and then the other is to think hard about the semantics of requests. That if a request is not, this is your life's mission and nothing else matters, but simply uh, a statement uh, as it probably is, that you know, all other things being equal, I'd be happier with some coffee than without. Right? So it's a sort of caterus paribus statement. It's a, it's a piece of gradient information about the utility landscape uh, in, this, in this current state. And um, so if, if that's the case, then as long as the robot doesn't mess up other parts of the universe, right, um, then it's still OK for it to get the coffee. So what this says is that the robot can do sort of minimally invasive solutions to tasks in order to avoid trespassing on the parts of the world where it doesn't know the utility function well enough, rather than sort of asking too many questions about the utility of things that it doesn't know. So I think this is a very interesting um, area for research. Um, let me talk about another example, <clears throat> right? Can we convince a robot uh, that it should let us switch it off, right? So we already pointed out that <clears throat> under the classical definition of an objective, um, the robot will disable its off switch uh, to prevent it from being switched off so that it can uh, complete the mission of fetching the coffee, right? Um, and uh, it's easy to show, in fact, that if the robot's uncertain about the objective, then um, it actually has an incentive to allow us to switch it off. So let's see how that goes. Right? We just set up a, we've set this up as a very, very simple um, little game between the robot, uh, which has, uh, you know, so classically it's going to have a choice of you know, doing some action which may, uh, which may be quite dangerous, but let's say that um, we have uh, uncertainty about the value of the action and at least at present, the robot is you know, slightly more convinced that this action is beneficial, meaning positive utility, uh, than, than harmful, which is negative utility. But there's a lot of uncertainty about the utility of the action. OK. Um, we could also give the robot the option of switching itself off, so it could just commit suicide. Um, and we'll fix the value of the robot being switched off at 0. And given that um, the expected value of the action is slightly positive, if this was the classical situation, the robot would then just uh, take the expectation and choose the act, right? Um, but we're also going to give the option uh, of waiting and then give the human the option of switching off the robot. And you might say, well, why would the robot do that? Right? If it gets switched off, it's never going to achieve its objective, okay? But the human is going to switch off the robot if the action that the robot is proposing to do is uh, bad, if it has negative utility, but not if it has positive utility. So the op giving the human the option to switch you off is a way of gaining information uh, about the utility function and gaining information that would let you avoid doing something wrong. Okay. So the human can choose between switching the robot off with value zero or telling the robot to go ahead. Now, if the robot uh, is given the go ahead, it can update its utility function, right? So now its belief is that the action was not negative, was not bad, and um, the posterior distribution of utilities is entirely positive, right? So you can see very straightforwardly that this is actually just a value of information theorem. Right, that the expected value of information is non-negative. And so the robot has an incentive to uh, allow itself to be switched off, and that incentive comes directly from the uncertainty uh, in the objective. Okay? And as that uncertainty goes away, 
uh, the robot loses the incentive to allow itself to be switched off. Okay, so um, to me, this is a clue that, that this way of thinking uh, is actually directly connected to solving the King Midas problem, to, uh, to building machines that are, that are safe. The difficulty um, is going to be in that, <clears throat> that third principle that we learn about um, we learn about human preferences from observation of human choice behavior. Okay, uh, and this, this is where the, the real difficulty lies. So the inverse reinforcement learning that many of you are familiar with, right, it's the, it's the inverse of reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning says, uh, here's a reward function, uh, produce the behavior that optimizes it. Inverse reinforcement learning is here's a behavior, produce the reward that it optimizes. Okay, so what is, uh, what is this agent optimizing when they're doing this behavior, okay? Um, so we can think of that as, okay, so here's the human uh, behaving, and then here's the robot outside the house, so to speak, looking in and, uh, and trying to infer what is the reward function, what are the parameters theta of the reward function that the human is optimizing, okay? Um, now, this isn't quite um, what we want. Right, so it's also important to remember that typically in inverse reinforcement learning, once the robot infers the reward function, it then adopts it, right? It becomes, uh, so for example, in Peter Abiel's helicopter uh, acrobatics stuff, um, once it learns the reward function that the human pilot optim is optimizing, it adopts it uh, and then op flies the helicopter itself. Now, we don't want that, right? If a human is having coffee for breakfast, we don't want the robot to then start drinking coffee for breakfast. That's not the point. Okay, so there's a sort of indexicality about whose reward function is being learned. Um, but we also have to think that, in fact, the human and the robot are going to be in the same environment. Okay, uh, and this is what we call cooperative inverse reinforcement learning. And this changes um, the, the way to think about inverse reinforcement learning actually quite significantly. Um, so. So this becomes a game, right? There are now two agents, and um, their, their actions and interactions actually really matter. So the human agent ha will assume has some preferences theta uh, and is acting roughly according to theta, um, and how roughly uh, actually matters a lot. Um, and then the robot's job is to maximize this unknown theta for the human. Um, but it, since it doesn't know what it is, it's going to have to start figuring it out. And we start with a prior um, P of theta. And so this is how we set the game up. Uh, and then um, and we solve it, right? Just we, we, cal we calculate the Nash equilibria of the game. Um, and indeed, what you find is, is that you don't get inverse reinforcement learning like solution. So in inverse reinforcement learning, the human is just behaving optimally according to their own preferences. And then the machine is watching them, watching this behavior. Um, instead, uh, in the optimal solutions of the game, the human actually actively teaches the robot, right? Because the human wants the robot to learn quickly so that the robot can help the human uh, optimize uh, the objective. Um, and the robot asks questions and will ask permission, will defer to the human, will let itself be switched off, and so on. And these are all just fall out as properties of the optimal solution of the game. Um, and if you're interested, there's a whole series of papers. So the first one was in NIPS um, 2016. Uh, and there's one uh, in uh, Symposium on Robotics Research in 2017, another one in ICML 18 on how you take this game and uh, reduce it to, for example, uh, a POMDP where the state of the POMDP is the physical state plus the, um, the parameters theta, so they, they become a sort of sufficient statistic um, for, uh, for the robot. And um, so you can look at those papers on how to solve these games and, and examples of their solution. Um, I can just give you a very uh, simple example just to, just to illustrate this, this point that the presence of the robot causes the human to behave in a different way uh, than they would if the robot wasn't there. Um, so this is a one-dimensional uh, problem. Right, so there's a single uh, preference parameter theta, which is sort of an exchange rate between paper clips and staples. So the, the state of the world has P paper clips and S staples, and 
the reward function for the human is theta p plus one minus theta s, so it's just an exchange rate. Um, and for this example, we'll make theta be 0.49, so the human has a slight preference for staples over paper clips. Uh, and the robot has no idea what, um, what that preference is, so the prior on theta is uniform between zero and one, okay? And um, in that case, uh, let's say we'll get, give the human the choice between uh, making uh, two paper clips, or one of each, or two staples. And if that was the end of the game, right, then uh, the values would be, um, you know, 98 cents, one dollar, and a dollar two. And so uh, the human would choose to make two staples. Okay, and then the robot has a choice, and the robot's actions are to make 90 paper clips, 50 of each, or 90 staples. Okay. And now with those choices, um, it actually becomes optimal for the human not to make two staples, which would be their own preference, but actually to make one of each. Because if you make two staples, then the robot's posterior becomes too shifted towards staples, and the robot will make 90 staples. And in fact, 90 staples is not as good as 50 of each for the human. Um, so by making one of each, the human conveys enough information uh, to convince the robot that 50-50 uh, is the right action, um, and then the human is better off, okay? So, um, there are lots and lots more things as you can imagine, right? So, the, the simple cell game is, is one robot, one human. You know, what about um, one robot and many humans, okay? Um, and lots of interesting things start to happen. Uh, first thing that would occur to you is, okay, well, how we've got more than one human, how are we going to uh, weigh up the preferences of those humans, right? We can't uh, optimally satisfy the preferences of both of them because there are going to be resource constraints in the world. So how do we weigh up uh, the preferences of people? So there's a well-known theorem by um, Hassan Yu, an economist, um, which says that uh, all Pareto optimal policies uh, for the robot are going to have the following property that they they optimize a linear combination of the preferences of the humans and the uh, exact weighting in that linear combination basically depends on uh, the options that the humans have to basically defect from this agreement and go do something else so someone who has more bargaining power ends up with higher weight in this linear combination um, and uh, but in Harsani's theorem you we assume uh, a common prior, so all the humans have to have exactly the same beliefs about the world, uh, which is an extremely restrictive case. So recently, um, Andrew Critch, who's a um, part of the research group at Berkeley, uh, proved what I think is a really weird counterintuitive theorem, which says that, uh, in fact, you should weight the preferences of the humans according to how well the human's prior beliefs or predictions turn out to be true. Okay, and so you, uh, you start out, uh, maybe you start out with equal weighting, but then as it turns out that the prior of human A is more accurate, that the observations that you make uh, are more in agreement with the prior of human A than the prior of human B, you give more weight to the preferences of human A, right? Um, which, which sounds a little counterintuitive, but in fact it allows, uh, it allows you to make agreements between people who disagree with each other uh, about the truth. You can basically say, okay, well, you think this, and you think that. Well, if you turn out to be right, you'll get the money, and if you turn out to be right, you'll get the money, and both parties will agree to that because they both think they're right. Okay, and so you can, you can form contracts in cases where you couldn't otherwise uh, get agreement between people. Um, there's a problem uh, called utility monster. So a utility monster is someone who has extreme reaction to uh, good and bad things happening, right? So, you know, they go outside in the rain, it's, oh, God, this is the terrible worst thing that's ever happened to me, I'm wet, you know, or they get a cookie and they're just over the moon, right? And, and so Nozick, who's a political philosopher, pointed out that this is a real problem for utilitarianism, that those people, those utility monsters, will sort of suck up all the resources of the world uh, if what you do is try to maximize the sum of utilities uh, in the world because they have much, much more extreme um, preferences. And, um, you know, I think that's an, that's an issue. Um, you know, some people say it's, you know, it's the death of utilitarianism. 
uh, but um, I think it's a, it's a problem to be faced because I can tell you having four kids, there are people like this. Uh, <laughs> And so uh, it, it's, it really does have to be um, dealt with. Um, you know, so if, if you, and another, another problem with this naive idea that the robot's job is to maximize the sum of everyone's utilities is that, um, you know, there are people in Somalia who, you know, are on the point of death and the robot could, could do the most for human utility by going, going to Somalia. So every domestic robot you buy is immediately going to leave uh, and say, I'm going to Somalia to help those people who are dying of starvation. So, you know, make your own dinner, you stupid human, right? Uh, you know, and so somehow that doesn't quite work because then, of course, you're not going to buy the robot in the first place. Um, and so there won't be any robots helping people in Somalia either. Uh, so how do we resolve these issues? I think there are lots of interesting, um, interesting questions. And you also have to worry about strategic behavior by the humans. Right. Again, if you have children, you know this. Um, they want help, and so they pretend to be more helpless than they really are, and so this is how the humans will behave in order to get more of the resources of the robot um, by lying about their preferences, effectively. Um, so you, can we set up protocols that are truth-revealing uh, rather than strategic? Um, and then this gets, you know, once you get to many, ro many robots, many humans, it gets even more complicated. Um, you know, there are lots of advantages of having lots of robots looking at lots of humans because they can learn, because, because human preferences have a great deal in common, right? They're not, they're not independent. Um, then learning about one human's preferences helps you predict the preferences of other people. It's what I call population IRL. Um, but then you've, now you've even got incentives for strategic behavior among the robots. And so we have to think hard about uh, setting up the right protocols uh, to avoid these, uh, making these problems incredibly complicated. Um, but the real issue is, is, the, is, is still the fact that humans are far from rational, right? And so when you're interpreting human behavior to understand the underlying human preference structure, you're seeing it through the human cognitive architecture, which is very, very complicated, and actually we don't know very much about it. But one thing we do know is that humans are computationally limited, um, you know, so when Lee Sedol plays a losing move uh, against AlphaGo, it's not because he wanted to lose, right? If you thought he was rational, then that's the only conclusion, right? Uh, he wanted to lose the game, that's why he made that losing move, but no. He made that losing move because he wanted to win, but he's computationally unable uh, to choose the right action. So you have to understand the extent to which humans are computationally limited, um, and in the real world, right, we are, we are vastly, you know, which is nothing like the Go board, right? in the real world, we are vastly computationally limited. In fact, we're, we're so limited that usually we can only think about the, cur the thing that we're currently doing. Right? So I'm giving a talk to you. So I'm really only able to think about what, you know, what I should say or you know, when to press the next slide button, right? Uh, I'm extremely limited. I'm not here thinking about whether I should sell my Tesla stock or, um, you know, or, or move to France or, or write a letter to the Senate complaining about something. Right? There's a, a billion things I could do which might be better than continuing to give this talk, but I, I'm, I'm kind of stuck giving the talk. So what can I, you know, and, and you're stuck listening to me, and so you could be doing all those things too, but you're not. So we're always in a subroutine, right? We're in, you know, we're in level 37 of some giant complex coroutine hierarchy uh, that we run, and th those are the choices available to us, you know, within that subroutine, you know, unless there's a fire alarm or some sort of, uh, some other kind of abort which bounces us out of the hi subroutine hierarchy. Uh, we're always in it. So you can't understand human behavior at all unless you understand what that hierarchy is and where people are in it uh, and how they manage their computational behavior. Um, okay, I'm going to skip through very quickly because we're running out of time. Um, you know, so if you, if you take this seriously, if you said, you know, like in 20 years' time, if you want to, if let's say you're a domestic robot manufacturer, okay, um, and you want to sell robots, you know, and you, you need a, you know, need to put in a, a decent uh, prior into the robot for what the preferences of the owners are likely to be. 
I'm going to go to the you know values R us corporation uh, and say, okay, I'd like to buy uh, you know human preference function uh, middle class uh, English speaking Western uh, please, and um, and they'll sell you something. What is it they're going to sell you, right? Think seriously about this because this is actually the problem that we're going to face. Uh, if you if you want to have a useful domestic robot, it's got to understand a great deal about uh, the preferences of people. So think hard about what those really are like. Um, how we we actually go about this? You know, what are, what are the representation problems? You know, the fact that we we we're clearly not going to express the preference function in terms of you know, a mapping from video sequences to numbers, right? It's not going to be like that. Right? It's it's bound to involve latent variables like how healthy am I, right? Um, well, you know, what's what's my financial well-being? Um, you know, how much sleep have I had? Things like that, right? Which are all latent variables. They're not directly part of the pixel stream that's coming to the robot. Um, it, and even a little bit of of um, Empirical exploration, for example, if you look at Kahneman's work, uh, you know we are far from an additive sum of rewards. Uh, that's very clear. We're, if, if anything, we're closer to a max, um, and we have weird memory effects. So there are you know, these, these experiments on surgery, uh, you know how much pain you experience during surgery, suggesting that in fact you know adding adding up the total pain is is sort of anti-predictive. Uh, that the maximum pain that you remember experiencing uh, is the thing that determines it, and what you remember is highly context-specific and has to do with the temporal sequence and lots of complicated things. So, um, and those really matter, right? Your me your memory, if you if you've had one traumatic experience in your life that keeps recurring, then your life sucks, right? Um, and uh, so you can try to learn how to forget it um, or, or not. But I mean, it's, it really matters. Uh, and um, it, you know, just thinking that we've conformed to some simple mathematical model is just a mistake. Um, I think there is an issue that you know, we don't have coherent preferences that satisfy the standard von Neumann axioms. Um, but probably that doesn't matter. In the sense that there's, you know, if your if your preferences are intransitive, so you know if if you prefer cheese pizza to sausage pizza and sausage pizza to pineapple pizza and pineapple pizza to cheese pizza, then tough, right? There's nothing, no pizza I can give you that will make you happy because there's always another one around the circle that you prefer. Uh, there's, there's no there's no problem that the AI community can solve for you, um, and. So we're only going to be looking at satisfying modulo incoherence, right? So up to the point where you are coherent, we can help you. Um, and the point is, we're really here trying to avoid catastrophe, right? We're not we're not trying to we're not worried at the moment about uh, polishing the fine points of, of preference optimization, but avoiding catastrophe. Uh, people worry about bad behavior. Doesn't that mean that the robots are going to learn to behave badly when they observe people behaving badly? No. Not at all. There's no reason to suppose that the robot's going to behave in any way like the humans that it observes because it's not adopting the preference function of the humans. It's simply learning to predict the preference function of the humans and presumably satisfying those preferences in ways that are least harmful to other people. Right? So even if the person doesn't care about the harm done to other people, the machine does, so it won't behave the same way at all. Um, there is one, I would say, moral issue that we have to grapple with, which is the preferences that people have for the suffering of others. Right? So, so we think about altruism as, you know, I gain um, pleasure from other people being happy uh, or other people avoiding suffering. Um, but there are people who gain pleasure from other people suffering. Um, and should we, therefore, try to satisfy those preferences? And I think the answer is no. Um, but that's a moral position um, that I'm taking on behalf of the AI community. Um, relativization is important. So people's well-being is not a, is not an absolute quantity, right? It's not to do with you know what kind of house do I have, you know how healthy are my children, um, you know do I sleep comfortably at night? It's to do with do I sleep more comfortably than the other people? Do I have a nicer house than the other people? Do I have more intelligent and beautiful children than other people? 
right? Um, and that relativization, I think, is, you know, it's a poisonous aspect of human psychological makeup, but it's a real one, and we have to figure out how do we, uh, how do we deal with that problem. Um, the most difficult thing for me is the plasticity of human preferences, right? The, the fact is we're not born with complex preference structures over what our future lives should be like, okay? Somehow we acquire them from our, from our peers, from our family, from our culture, um, and we have basically no understanding whatsoever about how to think of that process in a rational way. Right? Clearly it happens, and you could describe it psychologically. This is, this is what happens, this is why it, why it happens, but there's no sense in which we could say it's rational for you to change your preferences, right? And that means we have to be extremely careful uh, to avoid for example, the AI system modifying human preferences in order to make them easier to satisfy, right? Politicians can do that, they do it, but our AI systems have to be very careful. So we, we I think, need to understand this process and we need some real help from philosophers in understanding uh, how to think about plasticity of preferences um, so that we don't mess it up. Um, okay, so to summarize, um, I think if we do things right, uh, we can build provably beneficial AI systems. And uh, as far as I can see, uncertainty in the objectives is a key part of the solution to this problem. Um, and it means actually redoing a lot of the stuff. So many, many chapters in my textbook are kind of obsolete um, because they all assume a fixed known objective. Um, but unfortunately, I have to do the fourth edition this year, uh, and I haven't got replacements for those chapters, right? We don't, I have, don't know all of the new algorithms and methods that we uh, are going to need. Um, but fortunately, you know, standard AI is a special case where uncertainty has gone away completely, right? So it's, um, it's still useful uh, to have all the standard algorithms. Um, and then, if you, in case you're wondering, right, well, what are the other things to worry about besides the King Midas problem. Um, I think there's the Dr. Evil problem, right? Even if we have provably beneficial AI, uh, Dr. Evil is not gonna use it. He's gonna use other kinds of AI to try to take over the world. Um, and then there's the sort of, we might call it the wall -E problem, the pro progressive enfeeblement of the human race where AI is so good and useful for us that we stop being able to do anything ourselves. And this is a, you know, this is not a, a new story, um, I highly recommend a story called The Machine Stops, which was written by E.M. Forster in 1909, um, that laid out the future, uh, including the internet, um, iPads, video conferencing, MOOCs, um, computer-induced obesity, uh, computer-induced social isolation, um, and dependency on over-dependency on technology. Uh, so read, read that story and then think about uh, the future that we're facing. Thank you.